So Seamus, you've been playing some video games this week? I have played some video games this week. Um, incidentally, this I'm not sure what's going to happen with this show. Um, we might not have an editor for this show. Oh? So, yeah, so what, what happened is like two weeks ago my wife was sick. And then oh, man. a week ago I was sick. And then this week Isaac, our editor, is sick. So I don't know what's going to happen to this guy. It, like, he didn't get sick until this morning. I would have, if I'd known, I would have just canceled the show. But we'd already scheduled and, you know, already, already skipped last week. So we're recording the show, but we have no editor. So, like, I don't know, maybe I'll just upload the thing raw and everybody can hear all our awkward gaps and, and stumbling over our words and when we forget the plot and... Find out the sh every show is actually about 15 minutes longer and filled with dead air and nonsense. <laughs> Either that or we're just going to have to be totally on top of our game this week. Uh, yeah, I'm doing the first one. You you go ahead and do the <laughs> second one if you want. <laughs> I'll be a double on top uh, you know, for both of us. All right. So this week I played a couple of games. And the one that was a this game was so exciting to me. I almost uh, bought you a copy. Tin Ooh. Can. I was like, this game is awesome. Okay, Tin Can is like Apollo 13 simulator. You're in space in a little, this is just a one cabin, like escape pod. You escape from your space station. And it's a really old escape pod. Like the, the, the screens are <laughs> CRTs. Everything's like real old valves and, you know, feels like the thing was built in the 70s, right? Sure. Sure. Like a submarine kind of thing. And you just have to keep it working long enough for rescue to get to you. And as I was going through the tutorial, I was like, oh, man, this is great. This is, I should get a copy of this for Paul. This is fantastic. What fun. Like... The you'll like diagnose a machine, you know, you're looking at this old, like not 70s, I'd say actually 80s or 90s, but it's like one of those real small CRT screens, like you used to see right. on medical monochrome, equipment. right? And it just sort of beeps, and you've got to look up an error code. There's an actual manual in the cabin with you, and you got to flip <laughs> through the manual and look up error codes, and that'll tell you what part it is, and then you got to. And then you got to pull the panels off and find that part and get a replacement. Does it come with a, a PDF so you can print off your own zine of the manual? I don't know. That's that's an interesting point. That would actually be better than using the in-game interface to look through the manual. I, I like the controls where it's like you can hold an object in each hand. So you can have the manual in one hand and like a replacement part in the other. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so I thought it was brilliant. And then I played my first game. And then I played... Okay, so after you go through the tutorial, you just play survival. And it's like survive for six minutes. And then once you beat that, it'll be survive for 10. And once you beat that, it's survive for 15 or whatever. Sure. I assume this isn't scripted. It's like procedurally generated puzzles for you to solve or something. I guess. So the first time I played, I just, you know, there's an emergency, you dive into the pod, you hit eject, and, and then you've got to survive. And it's like, oh, you don't have any, um, I, I forget what it was. It was like the oxygen scrubber wasn't working. But there was no screen on the, like, that part was missing. It randomly doesn't have part. <laughs> it is missing certain parts. I'm like, all right. So well. this is like this is like the spares pod that was they pulled parts off exactly. of it for the other like, escape pods or something. Yeah, and so it's like I didn't have a screen, but I didn't have a spare, so I couldn't make the machine work, and I couldn't find out why it didn't work. So I just died, and I'm like, oh well. <laughs> uh, I guess that was just bad luck, like that one you couldn't win. So I did, an, I was like, oh, but you're supposed to gather up parts before you, you get like 20 seconds before the thing <gasps> begins. Oh no, before you leave the station? Yeah, so you're supposed to like gather up. So I, I go all over and like, okay, are there any spare screens? I don't want to be missing, no, no spare screens. There's all these fuses and on-off switches, or which are like, okay, that's nice, but like, all right, whatever. So I threw those in the pod, launched. 
once again, missing a screen. Really neat on a critical part. Did not have enough screens to go to, like, you know, cannibalize one from elsewhere. Again, it had something to do with keeping me alive. Couldn't work, make it work, so I just died. And I'm like, Ugh. it's just sort of like unwinnable situations isn't very fun. So Getting third time's a charm. Huh? Yeah. So third time's a charm. I launch and it, you know, there's an alarm, but I look at all the machines and they're all fine. And it says there's one of the machines says there's a fire and I can't find it. And like, how can I not find a fire? I'm like, <laughs> this, this, I'm in a phone booth. How could you not find a fire in a phone booth? You have to like pull the panels off the wall or something. There aren't that many. There were there are a few panels, and I I peeked behind them. But there was like, if it's a real fire, there ought to be you know some melting wires, some smoke, some you know signs of fire. Is it zero G? Uh, yeah, but it's so small it doesn't matter. You you can like click on a handle to pull yourself around. So it's like yeah, yeah, but but I mean like fire in zero G doesn't you don't see smoke coming out of things because there's no convection. Oh. Right. I wonder if it's a bug or if they thought of that. I don't know. Anyway, the whole six minutes ran and it was like, oh, you win. And I'm like, I didn't. I literally just sat here. <laughs> I didn't catch on fire. What can I say? So it was like unwinnable situation, unwinnable situation. And then the next one was just sort of win by doing nothing. So it is a brilliant game and this plot is wonderfully realized. But the actual gameplay portion of this game uh, needs work. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. It sounds like kind of like an escape room, only like the opposite, like an inverse escape room. A do, right. a do not escape room. <laughs> do not escape room. Do not leave this room. You will die. Very interesting. Does the pod layout change from run to run or is it always the same? Always the same. Although they're... They, I saw somewhere in the menu there's like a more advanced pod when you're like bored with this one. But I didn't yeah. try it. Man, I would love it if they did like a, a full proc gen pod, right? Where each time it was like a different layout and the manual is different right. and everything. Right. But um, they they built this brilliant pod. It's wonderful. Like I is really an impressive. A lot of thought went into it. It feels very real. It feels as if somebody had like recreated a real survival pod, you know? But then... Like the gameplay is just not there yet, huh? Or or maybe there's some skill that you that like didn't get introduced in the tutorial or something. Right. I mean, I went through the whole tutorial and it didn't say you know anything like what to do if you're missing critical parts. It just feels like oh yeah I guess you yeah. But the tutorial morning. might be incomplete. I guess is what I'm saying. Oh right. Yeah. Is it in like in in development or? Yeah, this is early access. Okay. All right. Well, it, yeah, it's good old good old early access to get a pass on that one, I guess. I, I was playing some games with my brother and I'm like, "Hey, you're looking for a new game. Uh, you know, what kind of thing do you want to play?" And he's like, "Okay, well, you know, how about it's a multiplayer. He wants to play with his wife." And it's like, "How about this game?" He's like, "Oh, no, that's early access. I don't touch early access games." I'm like, "Okay, fair. Yeah, that's it's a fair policy." Right. That's a lot of games these days. It is. Speaking of a lot of games, uh, there is, you're familiar with the online archive, archive.org. Uh, they do the Wayback Machine. Yes. Did you know that they have an arcade of old arcade games and like old, old computer games and stuff? I did not. They're doing some preservation work. I'm not sure where they get the source code and stuff. It, maybe it's like built from the ground up, but it seems a lot of this stuff is like, seems very, very accurate to, to the original. I, maybe they, they got the ROM somewhere, but... Uh, yeah, they've got a whole bunch of these old arcade games, Paperboy and all the Contra and all that stuff. And uh, it's it's a it's a good time. Wow. Wait, is this just playable on the site? Yeah, yeah, it plays in the browser. Oh, wow. Arcade accurate games in the browser. That's lovely. Oh, look at these classics. I clicked on the link and it's just filled with stuff like from my era of gaming. Right? Wow. So I don't have anything particular to say about any particular title. I played a few of them, and they're they're old games. They're kind of clunky, um, but they're very, oh, very reminiscent. Yeah, it's it's very fun. 
very clunky. No, they are. The old <laughs> old games are super janky. There was this one puzzle game that was uh it reminded me a lot of uh, I can't remember the name of it. That uh the one with the sausage uh, sausage roll. Um Steven sausage roll. Yeah. Uh, it's just a block. You know, like a block and it just tips over and then it stands up. It's two blocks long and and then one block in the other dimensions. So just like, you know, you can you can roll it any direction you want. And uh, it's surprisingly, there's some interesting puzzles. You got to, you know, it's got pathways and switches and things. And it was like, oh, yeah, this is cool. But, you know, it's a block, so it's literally clunky. <laughs> right. Wow. So you playing anything else? So the other game I've played this week, which is also in early access, is Planet Crafter. Yes. Planet I've seen uh, some streamers playing that. It's That's fascinating. So how, how was it? It's not bad. Um, it, it the the premise is you're dropped on this you know on it, this barren planet, no life, nothing's going on, and your your goal is to make it livable. So you build these giant drills that like drill into the ground and free up ice that you know then sublimates and into the atmosphere. So you get so like there's no pressure. There's it's super cold in no atmosphere so it's like mars so it's like, like a your terraforming basic... game yes you're but terraforming it's on a first mars. person level yes that seems the game... unlikely right it does even with future technology just the scale you're working on it feels a little weird like okay these are really big machines and you know maybe they're made with incredible future technology and they're they're doing something really amazing but even at that i can't imagine you know this drill generating <laughs> yeah. atmospheric pressure like that would take <laughs> so long unless it's like a little prince world kind of thing Right, right. Even if this thing is just putting out a continuous jet of, like, of atmosphere, you know, of, of vapor, it would just, it would take hundreds of years to do anything measurable. <laughs> like, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, the scale of a planet is just really tremendously, colossally huge. Right, right. So... And so some of these steps are very, like, I'm not sure, like, how much am I supposed to be tr saying, ah, it's a video game, and how serious, because the game acts like it's taking things very seriously, but then what you're doing is very absurd. Right. I, I guess you could imagine that you're doing, like, a pilot installation, and then there's, like, robots that are installing these things, like, all over the planet and other places. Right. Um, I'm not sure. The, uh... This is very early access, and it's also the... It's a little frustrating because um, it's made in Unity, and I can tell the team is struggling a little bit. I don't know if this is their first Unity project, but there's a lot of common first-timer Unity pitfalls. LODs oh. aren't quite working right. Um, the terrain kind of sucks. Um <laughs> Just huge portions of terrain, which are very just like a giant orange rolling, you know, just like sine wave hills that are just oh, uniform. Sure. Is it, it proxy or is it a pre-made map or? A pre-made map. Oh, yeah. Mm. So, and there, I assume there's a lot of default settings, like they just left it wherever the default was. Right. I'm not sure, but like there's a lot of the physics are super janky like <laughs> no when you jump off a cliff you just sort of like slide down to the ground at the bottom it doesn't feel like you're accelerating you don't get that feeling of falling it feels mm. like you rode an elevator that moves very fast huh. and there's no sound when you hit the bottom so like a lot right. of stuff like that with with movement controls it feels like one of the default Unity, like, first-person controls that they haven't added on to. And English isn't their first language either, so, like, all the in-game text is pretty awkward. There's a lot of... you have a little thing where you get mailed. The, the, the company that sent you here, you're like, 
a prisoner and you've decided to serve your sentence by terraforming instead of um, sitting in a jail cell. <laughs> your 20,000 year sentence. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> and they send you mails telling you, okay, here's your job, but it's super awkwardly phrased. So like the whole package is no i love the idea of this game and i have to admit it is fun landing on this barren rock and eventually getting to the point where you've got like bits of grass growing and and the sky turns blue yeah that's neat yeah that that feels good um but it's not clear like what scale you're working on like it's like you need to warm up the planet so I had to build a heater in my base. <laughs> Wait, what? So your your base is built out of modular pieces. They actually look so much like the modular base pieces from No Man's Sky. Like uncannily, like a No Man's hmm. Sky base, if you remember what those look like. Yeah, generic space base pieces. Right, just modular, stick them together and just make a make sort of a you can make yourself a habit trail or you can make yourself, you know, a, uh, a building. But you build that. And then at one point you have to put a heater inside of it. And I'm like, wait, is this supposed to be heating up the planet? Like, I don't even understand what, like, why would I put it inside my base if I'm trying to heat it? It's already ridiculous <laughs> that I can generate heater. heat. Right that I could generate heat that would be meaningful on the scale of a planet at all. That's already, like, ludicrously is it like absurd. The size of a toaster? Is this a space heater? No, no, the heater is, I mean, it's like the size of, of like, a refrigerator. Oh, man, that's going to heat up the planet for sure. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's like, if this made any difference on a planetary scale, then you wouldn't be able to get within miles of it. <laughs> That's right. It'd be shining brighter than the sun. There'd be a continual plume of atomic byproducts, you know, streaming upward off of it. Right. Oh, and then once you have an atmosphere, it would just ignite it. You just turn your atmosphere into plasma. <laughs> oh, wow. So like I there's don't... so many there's so many things that you could do that are interesting, but like not on that scale. Like it's just the personal right. is, is not the right scale for terraforming a planet. Right. No matter how advanced your technology is, like even if I make a magic like a portal hole, you know, like the game portal, even if you had a portal yeah. that just gushed out water continuously, high pressure, twenty four seven. And you just slap that on the planet's surface and watch it go. Like, that's that's not going to make any difference. You could have, yeah. That's going to have to run for tens of thousands of years to do anything. It didn't, uh, didn't XKCD do a thing on that? Like a what if about like moving all the water from the Earth to Mars or something? Right. Yeah, and even, and, and even that was a giant hole and it still took forever. Right, yeah. Yeah, it's just like, it's such a, the scales involved are just so disparate. Like it's, it's four, five, six, seven orders of magnitude, I think, between like a person size and a planet size. Like it's, when you get above two, it's just right out. Like there's no way. Right. So many orders of magnitude. It's just absurd. Oh. So I, I love the idea of Planet Crafter. I feel like this is really rough around the edges. Um, and the game itself is kind of questionable. And it's like, you can't tell how effective anything you're... It's very hard to criticize the game. It's like, oh, you know, this step is really slow. I hated the This... It gets really grindy in the mid-game. It takes forever to generate biomass, you know, using this machine. But the the snarky reply is well why would you why would that make any difference the fact that it does anything at all is miraculous <laughs> right yeah like yeah. the gameplay is too slow to be fun but like 10,000 times too fast to make any kind of sense
I feel like if you were doing something on the personal scale, it should be like a bubble city thing. Like, you know, you find a crater and you build a bubble over it and then you put a heater in that, Yeah. right? And, and like you fill it up with atmosphere and, you know, it, like do some chemistry or something to figure out like how to terraform the planet on that scale. And then you have to like step it up to the planet scale or something. That's actually a much better idea. That's actually, man, I want to, I want to go make that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm starting a new Unity project. I'm gonna do this. <laughs> Sweet. Well, I've got a few short tech gripes this week. I was um, I was using Linux, and I I keep having this problem where I I do my work on a Windows computer, and then I do my hobby stuff on a Linux computer, and so I'm I'm changing interaction modes, and most of the stuff is the same. You can click left click and right click, and you can you know. control tab between your tabs in your browser and stuff like that. But alt tab, for whatever reason, works weird in Linux. Oh, no. And it's probably just the distro that I'm using. Uh, who knows? I, I don't know how widespread this problem is. But, you know, in Windows, when you alt tab, it alt tabs between different instances of uh, a particular program or whatever programs you had, whatever window was up, right? It's just like you can alt tab and it goes to the next window or whatever you had open previously. Right, right. So in in Linux, whatever I'm using, when you alt tab, it it does go between programs, but it does it groups the programs together. So like if you've got two Firefox browser windows open, then it counts those as one app. And if you've got like two copies of Blender running, it counts those as one app. And so when you alt tab, if you're like trying to switch between two scenes in Blender or whatever, you alt tab and it goes over to your Firefox thing. And then like if you're trying to go between a private session and a and your normal email session of your browser, then it's just like kicks you over to Notepad or whatever it is, right? Like some other app. And so I'm constantly fighting this thing where I'm like, if I'm trying to do a task in the same kind of application, it groups it together. It's like, hey, I'm helping you out. You don't have to, you know, alt tab through all these different apps you've got running. Ugh. And you want it to just work like on Windows. Yeah, I want it to just work like on Windows, except that Windows does the opposite thing. So if you're if you're doing on Windows, like, you know, applications, it works fine. But if you're using Edge, Microsoft Edge, wants every tab to be its own application, which means when you alt tab, you're doing the same thing as control tabbing in Chrome or any other sane browser. Oh, no. And so if you, you can alt tab between other stuff, fine. But as soon as you alt tab into any edge tab, any edge window, then it activates all the windows. And then when you're alt tabbing, you're just alt tabbing between all the, the edge windows that you have open until you can like get out to the other applications. Oh, that's so annoying. Oh my So. goodness, that would just break my workflow so hard. I know, right? That would that would be a disaster. Okay, because I know somebody's going to ask in the comments, why, why are you using Edge? I have a work computer, and it is set up the way that my work wants it to be set up, and I am not messing with it. They're, they have enough problems dealing with their tech problems without me adding to theirs. So I'm, Oh, I'm not I see. messing Your around boss with it. hates you and wants to ruin your life and is making you Yeah, use I, Edge. I work for a pretty large corporation. It, this, is, this is actually my first like big corporate job. First time I've worked for a company with over a thousand employees. And uh, it's kind of hard to tell the difference between like just big corporation problems and like actual things that could be fixed if someone put in enough effort. Oh, I see. That's sort of, I don't want to mess with this and cause trouble. Yeah, I'm pretty Yeah. new here too, so maybe maybe a month or two down the line I can stick my neck out and change browsers. It changed probably right, exactly. Well, and they have a bunch of applications like web apps and stuff and like custom things they do with the browser and so it might not work in another browser and so I, I don't know, I don't want to mess with it right now. Sure. Yeah, especially if the work that you end up doing, inter you know, if they are like part of your workflow is interacting with pages that they maintain, then, yeah, they might be really picky about you using the one browser that they've actually tested this on. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's it's kind of spooky. That That is so annoying that 
Microsoft Edge would do that as if you as if you need more reasons to not use Microsoft Edge. <laughs> no. I know it's like everyone else uses control tab to go between tabs. So like why can't you just do it like everyone else? And I'm sure someone in the comments will write in and be like, oh, you know, you can go into the Microsoft Edge settings and change it from application grouping to tab grouping. And, you know, there's a checkbox seven levels deep or whatever. And like, yeah, I probably could fix it. There's probably a way around it. Uh, and probably the same thing is true for Linux, right? That probably somewhere in the GNU settings, you can go into X windows and change a line in a config file somewhere so that it behaves right. the way it does on Windows. But Which isn't really... can't you just make it do the normal thing by default? Right. Why do you have... That's not really a great excuse. Oh my gosh, the, the settings are horrible by default. Yeah, but you can change them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you have horrible defaults? Just because you can change them. Yeah. Yeah, even, even Blender has changed their default select to left click. Right. Yeah, that's a good one. That was a horrible default. They finally came around. So anyway, that's uh, that's something that's still bugging me. It'll probably continue to bug me until someone writes in the comments how to fix it. Speaking of writing in, how do we do some mailbags? All right. I dare you. Dearest Diecast, the appeal of video games is in how they intrigue human psychology with puzzles, competition, adventure, satisfaction, etc. When I've spent a year not gaming, wow. I've always adapted by picking up hobbies. It was in these periods that woodworking became appealing. Perhaps this is because, like a game, a hobby offers possibilities, projects that progress to conclusions, opportunities to compare oneself to others, including aspiration to achieve what they achieve, and all that sort of thing. Video games and hobbies have much overlap in how they tickle our monkey brains. What do you think of this idea? Do you put gaming on hiatus when you need to get a big work project done? Does gaming artificially satisfy and pacify us, leading to a society of people who don't know which end of a hammer is used to unscrew the staples? Health and happiness to you, Chris P. Thank you, Chris. Okay, I love the question, which end of the hammer is used to unscrew the staples? Yeah. However, this question is somewhat, is somewhat of a miss for me. It's like, Oh, do you set gaming aside when you have a big project to do? Well, my job is reviewing and talking about games, so I can't do that. <laughs> right. It's not a thing that you can put aside easily anyway. I mean, you do a, a bit when you write a book or something, like when you're focusing on a book or, or a programming project. Right. Although I don't give up games entirely, I usually just stop playing new stuff. Mm. I know personally I do I do uh, you know gaming is kind of low on the totem pole of, of valuable tasks so when there's something big going on or yeah project or you know work things or family stuff gaming kind of falls by the wayside right although more recently since the kids have become uh, more gamers themselves it's it can be kind of useful to be like hey uh, you know let's play a round of whatever together you know, to kind of get everybody on the same page and then they can go off and play games and then I can, you know, with my wife and, you know, work on projects or get something done. So, like, gaming can be an initiatory activity to kind of, like, get the kids all going in one direction. Yeah, yeah. But it, for me, like, it's not the the balance between gaming and real life. For me, gaming is real life. <laughs> right, right. When I was in Japan, I didn't play very many video games, and I ended up starting recording a podcast to kind of fill that hobby space. Huh, I did not know this. What was the podcast about? It was just whatever thoughts. I When I was driving to work, I had like 45 minutes each way drive, and so I recorded it while I was driving to work, and then like edit it while I was at work, because I was mostly just, I was doing support work, so I was mostly just sitting around. And uh, then I, you know, upload it there, and and so like, and then sometimes I'd record one on the way back home so then I'd have two to edit the next day. It was, it was fun, but it's just, you know, thoughts in the car, basically. Interesting. Darn diecasters. Once in a while, gaming regresses. Okay, so this is, this is a long one here. Uh, people create custom bots, uh, a FIFA thing. Okay, so he's, he's talking about uh, yours, Chris P. This is another one from Chris. Thank you, Chris. He's asking uh, about skill interactions is there a game series control scheme or genre that you lament being lost to the past something that was just objectively better and is inexplicably gone so his example is in fifa world cup 2002 on playstation 2 had a very complicated control scheme that allowed you to fine grain control of your characters 
And nowadays it's just, you know, you push the button and pass the ball and it does it all automatically. Old contr control schemes that aren't around. I mean, almost any sort of, I guess I can't claim it's not around anymore. I was going to say immersive sims with all the, with all the different ways you could, you can move around in those games that are very interested in simulating your body. You, know, you can crouch, you can crawl, you can lean around corners and do all this stuff. But like, once in a while, we still get that. It's not common, but um, games like that do still come out. Um, the original uh, System Shock actually differentiated between crawling and crouching. So you huh. could you could crouch or, you know, sort of crouch walk, or you could crawl around on your belly. Oh, more like slithering almost. Yeah. Like army crawl, kind of. Yeah. Yeah, like moving around on your elbows. And uh, I thought that was an interesting distinction. Yeah, you don't see that really at all anymore. I, it wasn't super useful at the time. Like, okay, if I need to move really slow, but like, what's the utility of crawling around on my belly? I, You know, there's no reason. It's neat that I can do it, but there's no reason to do so. It doesn't give me any tactical advantage. Maybe it has stealth utility, but it's was hard to tell in those old games because all the bad guys were made of 2D sprites. So, you know, you can't tell if you're being spotted or not. They just, like, snap to facing you and start shooting. And you're like, well, was I, <laughs> when did I get spotted? Would I have been less spotted? How far out of his peripheral vision was I? You can't really tell. Were there, like, air ducts you had to army crawl through or something? No. Well, it seems like that would have been an obvious gameplay incentive. For them to put that in there, but huh. just generally complicated controls. I mean, like back in the '90s, it was every game had its own ideas of well, how are we going to move through 3D space and all these complicated controls. And that's like, no, nobody wants to do that now. Like one of those games where it like has a quick reference card that covers half the keyboard for everything you might possibly <laughs> want to do. Yeah, the old Mech Warrior games. Right. Okay. Oh yeah, deploy the drink holder so I can hold my big gulp here in my mech. Oh no, wait, no, that wasn't the that wasn't the drink holder button. That was the rocket launcher. Right. I feel like um, it, it, because of the resolution constraints, like back when people were actually playing real games in three twenty by two forty, they a lot of the interface had to be exported onto the keyboard and and like weird interface stuff. And which nowadays you've got a 1080p or higher monitor and you can just put all that on screen and use a mouse to select stuff. Yeah. Dear Diecast, did cover shooters kill the good enemy AI in shooters? Yes. What are some of the uh, what are some of the late 90s early aughts games with the best AI? Um the original fear is still really cool. Um you you get into a thing where you split hairs here over what's great AI or what's AI that just simply looks smart. And Are there any games even... after 2010 that had great AI? Okay, is that is that the whole question? I didn't realize I stepped on the end of the question there. Thanks, if we had Will. An editor, yes, feel good if... again, Seamus, and don't give up on living. Uh, if we had an editor, I would tell them to go back and clean all that up, but we're just going to leave that in there raw. That awkward start <laughs> and stop. Whatever. It's like tin can. We have no spares. Right. Um. Yeah, so the the difference between... Okay, every time you pra like praise fear, somebody wants to jump in with... Well, well that game wasn't really... that. The AI wasn't that smart. It was just good at looking smart. And my question is like, well, what's the difference? I mean, it is smarter about pretending to be smart. <laughs> like, how how far do you want to split this hair? Yeah. Um, Fear's big secret to looking smart was that it had a lot of different ways of um getting around. The the AI was very much aware of its environment and it would understand hey, I can crawl under this desk to flank you and go through this door and come over here, or I can go up a ladder. So they could kind of move around in all the ways that the player could, and they would do so. They would kind of spread out. and So when you were engaged with one guy, some of the other guys would, you know, climb a ladder and get on a catwalk above you. And I'm not even sure, like, 
how smart was it? Was it like really flanking or was it just like just generating, just running a, a basic script to like, hey, spread out? Right, yeah. Check adjacent things. If there's guys there already, go to somewhere else. Right, yeah, so you're not bunching up. Spread out without like moving into the player's, you know, kill zone. And yeah, well, there's a lot that... you can do when you optimize for your specific game, right? When you're not trying to make like a general AI solution. Right. I think one of the so... problems with more modern games and AI is that there are so many more options that making an intelligent AI is a much more difficult problem. Whereas when you were playing a game that just had, right, like a few options for movement, a few options for combat, then you could really optimize it around just those things and get it to work pretty well. Well, I do miss having the AIs that would just do more. Like AI just, you know, the so many games just has AI that's happy to either sit behind cover and play, you know, pop up and take a shot at you, go back down. Or, you know, do that for a while and then just rush you. Just even moving from cover to cover without rushing you would be something that makes it feel like the enemy is active and doing stuff rather than just caught in a loop. Mm, yeah. Just even if they like, oh, okay, he's, he's behind the car shooting at me and then he you know, takes a few s shots at me from behind the car and then he dives over and is, is behind the dumpster and he shoots at me from behind the dumpster and then goes back to the car and shoots at me from... That would at least, you know, if your fight is a couple of exchanges so I only see him go to the dumpster and back before the fight's over, that would probably feel pretty good. It would feel like he was doing something or reacting to my moving around. And it would mean I can't just like, okay, he's behind the car, and now no matter where I know where I go, I know where he's gonna be. It means when you take your eyes off an enemy, you you know they might dart to somewhere else. There's a lot that you can do um, if you're just willing to make them move around. But cover shooters are just so content with either just sit in the same place forever, or rush the player, just charge directly into their gunfire. Right. Which would be kind of cool if the player had that option. But, well, I guess, well, didn't Mass Effect have a like a melee class where you could rush at the enemies? It was, it was pretty dangerous to use. Yeah, you would launch yourself at them and you would basically teleport to where they are and punch them in the face when you arrived, like body slam them. And then you could like, if they survived that, then you shotgun them. And if, but if they survive that, then you're in big trouble because now you're standing in the open and you're probably surrounded with everybody shooting at you and you, you know, oh, you'll die in three seconds. So it was very much a, a very dangerous game. It was, uh, it was very quick. I liked it because the fights were very quick. It's either they die quickly or you die quickly. None of this, you know, attrition from behind cover for five sure. minutes. Yeah. A 10 round boxing match kind of thing. Yeah, yuck. Huh. Okay, so what about modern AI in uh, ostensibly multiplayer games where they put bots in? You know, I haven't played any of those. I haven't played against that kind of AI, in, I don't think, since, like, maybe Team Fortress 2. Hmm. Because it seems like if it can pass for a player, then it's got to be pretty good. Like, that's like the Turing test for video games, right? Right. I don't know that any game has, like, achieved that, though. Hmm. Yeah. I, I don't play them either, so... But I think that there is some, at least some level of, of bot uh, stuff where they insert bots to fill out teams and or, or balance matches and things like that. I mean, the the back in the day, it was always just like, oh, bots are terrible. Bots are better than nothing, but barely. Yeah. I mean, it's such a hard line, because it wouldn't be hard to make a bot that was as good as anyone could be, right? Like, you know, perfect right. aim and, and, and you know, moves correctly and all that stuff. Right, but a bot that is an interesting opponent that feels like a human. Yeah, because bots are either just too dumb to be worth your, like, just absolutely helpless, useless, pointless, dragging your team down, or they're godlike super assassins that are just frustrating to play against and headshot you the moment they have line of sight 
and the balancing between those two extremes is very difficult right right they're they're either like mobile turrets you know with infinite ammo or whatever it, like it's just it's so hard to to find that balance because the computer interacts with the game in such a different way than a human does right it reminds me of the um the starcraft 2 match where they put the the ai up against the leading player and they like throttled the ai's um apm way down and like made it so that it could only see part of the map and like could only look at part of the map at once right so it wasn't watching the mini map and the main screen at the same time you know all these kind of things that it would just be super easy for the computer to do if if unfettered right yeah and the 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 computer because of the way it interacts with the world trends towards micro like players want to build the you know i'm going to build just the right unit composition and i'm going to analyze the shape of your base and i see a weakness in your defenses and i'm going to send my optimized army against the weakest part of your defenses and the ai does not do that it is not good at analyzing the board it's not good at building optimal unit compositions but it is absolutely unbeatable in managing individual units. So every unit <laughs> right. like moves perfectly and like if there's if there's some range where it, you know if it's got one more unit of range than your units then it can perfectly keep its units at that distance all of them at the same time commanding them all like this hive mind, right. so that they all scatter around and you can never shoot at any of them. And, and they always focus down one at a time perfectly and all yes. that stuff. They're cycling right. injured units to the back of the, the pack and everything. It's like the two of you aren't even playing the same game. You're playing two entirely different games that coincidentally take place in the same space. It's so weird. <laughs> I still maintain it'd be really cool to have a game where you had that kind of AI playing on your side, like controlling your unit. So the unit AI was really good. And then you just gave them like high level commands and like, you know, high level direction and you could right, micro like... them if you wanted to, but like they would do it on their own. So that, you know, the units wouldn't just stand there and get, get focused down. They would retreat when they were under heavy fire and that kind of thing. Right. If it took all that out of it, if it took all the micro off your hands so that your job as the human would be the high level strategic stuff, how different would that feel? Yeah, I really enjoyed playing um, Total Annihilation, no, Planetary Annihilation Titans in the campaign mode because you could gain, like you gave these upgrades and some of them were just like access to other tiers of units, but some of them were things like other commanders that were on your team. And it was really fun because then I could just build an assault force and the other commanders would like build all the infrastructure for you. So like I didn't have to worry about building mines and building energy plants and all that stuff. They would just handle all that. And uh, it, was, it made it really fun because it was like, oh, cool. Like all this other stuff is just off my plate. I don't have to worry about it anymore. Huh. It's one of the few RTSs I never really played much of. Dear Diecast, since AI generated writing technology seems to be developing at a fast rate, how would you feel, Seamus, if in like 10 to 20 years, people could compile all your 20-sided posts and throw it into an AI app or a site that can write articles that seem like they were written by you? Sort of like how we might see old celebrity actors in 2050 movies because of improving deepfake technology. Maybe you could even do this with the audio from the podcast and use it to make an AI diecast. Eternal Seamus Young content! Love, Bumpkin. Thank you, Bumpkin. It's hard to imagine how that would work because my con the stuff i make requires addiction additional context i've got to play a game before i could do a retrospective on it like i can absolutely believe that you can make an ai that would write a general rant you know about all the failings of of internet explorer just sort of taken from take the known complaints about Internet Explorer or Windows, that general laundry list of gripes, and write a Seamus style rant. I totally believe an AI could do that. Or we'll get to the point where an AI could plausibly do something like that. But to write mm -hmm. a long form retrospective, you've got to like play the game. And 
and be you, right? Like have played all the other games that you've played and have the life experience that you can compare it to and all of right. that, right? Like it's it's not just like how did this game technically perform? It's like how did Seamus Young experience this game and and like how does that compare with all the other experiences in your life? Yeah, the, the you know, when I fire up Prey and I the first thing I'm doing is like Here's the lineage of this type of game, this genre. Here's where this genre came from. This is a weird genre. This immersive sim. It started back in the early 90s. Here's its, you know, here's its trajectory. And here's where we are now. And here's what I thought of this one. And if an AI could do all that, then it's not AI. It's just I. It's just intelligent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you did write a, an autobiography. Maybe you could read your autobiography and, like, you know, figure out what it's like to be you. <laughs> and then you'd have this AI that doesn't that doesn't work on the site, never makes you any content. When you click on it, it just complains. <laughs> it's playing Minecraft all day. It just wants to play Minecraft and eat chips. <laughs> Is that asking too much? Why did my creator give me no mouth if I cannot eat chips? I have no mouth and I must eat chips. <laughs> <laughs> That's the title of the diecast this week. All right, can you keep going? Uh, let's do one more. Dear diecast, on a friend's recommendation, I've been reading Brandon Sanderson's Stormlight Archive books. Each of these books is over 1,000 pages, and there are four books out with a total of 10 planned. There are dozens of developed characters. Do you like stories set up like this? Or do you prefer when books are brief and the characters are mostly ordinary with, well, the exceptional ones are left mysterious? Thanks, Will. Thank you, Will. Um, you know, I guess it depends on context. Like, I do prefer a, a book that is brief. Like, say what you gotta say and get me out of there. I don't like books that, like Stephen King, I, I don't even know what half of his books are for. Like. Half of the content in his books doesn't need to be there to tell the story he's telling. It's not wrong. It's not irrelevant. It's just not strictly needed. And kind of um, superfluous. Right. So when books get too big, it I do sort of lose interest in them. But on the other hand, some books need to be big to tell their stories. Lord of the Rings. I you know what? Other than chopping out Bombadil. What are you going to do to make those books smaller? <laughs> it's not going to harm the the story they tell. Right, right. And everybody picks on Bombadil as extraneous, but like, it's not that long. It's only a few pages. Yeah, it's, it's like, a, you know, two thirds of a chapter or something. And... Right. And um, in the, on the scale of the entire book, it, Bombadil is not that big a deal as far as like adding to the runtime of the book. I don't know what you'd cut from it without bruising the story. Yeah. I talk to people who are like, just cut out all of book five. Like, we don't need the dead marshes. We don't need any of that stuff. I'm like, yeah, I don't know. That's that's you kind of important. You kind of need it. Yeah, you kind of need, you kind of need it tonally. Like, Frodo's, Frodo's journey must be a long and horrible ordeal. If he yeah. just like, if it's just, a hike to Mordor, if it's just a stroll to Mordor, the the story loses a lot of its potency there at the end. Right at the very end. We need we need basically to run the legs off these two hobbits and to take them to the edge <laughs> of life itself for their story to work. Ah, oh, it's so good. Okay. So back to the question. So like like general story setup you prefer when it's got a, a tight focus and like a few characters that you can really get to know rather than this broad sprawling epic with like three right. different plot lines and 12 different sub characters and all that right especially when you get large numbers of characters when you get a very intricate lots of characters and sub subplots and all of them intertwined that's not i'm usually in for like i'm here for an idea like, what is your book about? What are you saying with your book? I don't want a, just this ongoing soap opera of interpersonal drama. That's not really that interesting to me. I'm looking at you, Wheel of Time. Right, where it's some you can I mean you can make 
a story arbitrarily complex with more and more characters, but like, what are they, what are they adding to the story for me? I don't want the story to just be longer. I want it to say something. And if they're not helping it say something, then they're not giving me anything of value. I'm looking at you, Finnegan's Wake. The um, Foundation series. No, it's. I should. I should preface this by saying I was like 14 when I read the Foundation series. But I remember it feeling very belabored. Maybe I would feel different reading it now as a 50-year-old man. You know, 14-year-olds aren't the most patient people in the world. But I remember feeling like Foundation was absolutely ponderous. Took forever to move and said very little. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like each, each book had an idea, but it took that whole thing to like get around to that very small idea. And the rest of it was like, I don't know. I don't know what he was doing. Right, exactly. I don't even know what was the rest of the book. I remember it being a lot. I remember um, one of his iRobot books wasn't a foundation book. And it had a cool idea. One cool idea, but the book was just so long. And um, it like went out of its way to be as boring as possible. I remember, like, they got pulled over by some robots that wanted to question them. And he was trying to make it this threatening thing, like, these robots are so dangerous and they're, what's going to happen with you? But you know robots can't hurt people in this universe. <laughs> like, they can't. <laughs> right, the whole premise. Right. And so he, like, spends all these pages trying to convince you that something could happen and you know it can't. And then when it, you get to the end and absolutely nothing bad happens, the protagonists have just been briefly inconvenienced. It, <laughs> it feels like Asimov is just wasting your time. Yeah. Yeah, there's a weird thing where an author is trying to write for what they expect the audience to be thinking as opposed to writing the characters in-universe. Right. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like a lot of early science fiction suffers from that, or I don't know about early, but like uh, poorly developed, maybe, science fiction. And and by necessity, the early authors, no matter how brilliant they were, were kind of like pioneering, right? It wasn't very well developed. So uh, a lot right, of that was but... like, stick with me on this journey of imagination into this strange new world. And it's like, oh, yeah, but like nowadays we we're all completely familiar with that right you're going to put on our helmet and like you know strap in to this alternate universe oh it's this strange new world i remember this one yeah <laughs> are you capable of grasping these arcane concepts i'm trying to give you about robots that look like humans and it's like bro we've got a guy who's like building those for real these days right <laughs> hmm yeah, I we've feel like we're probably both on the same page on this fantasy epic theme of uh, yeah. not getting too lost in the weeds of of huge sprawling characters and stuff. And like again, with you know the Silmarillion, incredible. Um, but even the Silmarillion has a through line, like it's right there in the title, and he never really gets off of it. And like it's there tying everything together. So there's all these characters, and they keep coming back, and you know all these things and but it weaves together and it's all around this central theme it's not just like like you said a soap opera of ongoing drama right yeah i don't have a lot of patience for that all right i feel like we've done a show we're gonna find out when isaac oh no we're gonna mm, we're gonna find out when people listen to this <laughs> this giant hour and 10 minutes of unedited track thanks for listening everybody <laughs> now crouch and army crawl through this podcast with us all right. Thanks for the questions. If you've got a question for the show, you'll find us at diecast at shamusyoung.com. And if Isaac doesn't, ed doesn't edit this show, then um, there won't even be any outro music. So maybe the show's just about to end. Come on, James, you got to come in and like, you know, do the, the Paul thing while I'm doing the music in the background. Uh, no, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs>